Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back uh, to our second part of two in Q&A or on Q&A. Um, we've been with you now for nearly just short of half an hour um, looking at tackling uh, potential questions that you put to us. Uh, just before the uh, short interval, we had two questions from uh, our sister. Uh, one was on the matter of Qurbani. Uh, whether it is uh, sound to do qurbani in this country and i explained hopefully in uh, both urdu and in english uh, with regards to that and the second question that she had was regarding the fidya that is given for qada salah for the deceased uh, whether it should be restricted to the wheat the barley and the flour or whether you can include other items in there including money and we had one other question uh, from our dear friend in uh, Peterborough who raised the question. I uh, was happy, alhamdulillah, with the response that we gave a couple of sessions back, I think maybe on Friday actually, uh, with regards to the journey of the soul. So we thank him for the question because it allowed us to fully explain uh, the process which is involved uh, in there. But he did have another question uh, which he wanted to seek clarity on. And that question was... Um, And that uh, question was that it is um, about what happens to the soul when it's associated with the body and it's returned back. How aware is it? Well, we know, for instance, that the hadith mentions that when a person is buried in the grave, that he is aware of people around him. Reason being is because uh, we are told or we are instructed to stay around the deceased for around 40 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, the time it takes to slaughter a camel and have its meat distributed, which is about, like I said, half an hour or so. Uh, why? Because it gives comfort to the deceased as they see you there. There's also talk about the uh, patter of footsteps that the deceased can hear when we leave them after we've gone. Similarly, when we come to the grave, we say, Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al kubur uh, min al mu'minina wal muslimin. Uh, so we're addressing the believers. Now, you do not give salam onto any person or thing that cannot respond back to you. So you do that when something, somebody can respond. And so this numerous, and you know, the understanding that we have is clearly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bestow upon the deceased the ability to sense and hear those that are around them. Um, there's no doubt about that. There's difference of views as to whether the deceased can is aware all the time. Many, are, some are of the view rather, that no, once the deceased dies, that's it. They can't hear, they can't see, and, and that's it. You know, they're just in, in a different domain. Uh, however, I, I would be more inclined towards the view that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bestow the ability on the deceased to be aware of those who are around them uh, uh, from the th two, three points that I made to you earlier. So I hope that satisfies uh, uh, our brother's curiosity and uh, answers that particular question for him. Uh, and remember, when we do get answers to questions, then please do share it with us because the way we're going to remove ignorance or the way we're going to, you know, kind of change the status quo is by sharing knowledge. You know, I learned from somewhere and I've shared it with you. It's, you know, I didn't have this knowledge when I was born. I, I clearly learned it from somewhere. I learned it from somebody. So I've now shared it with you. So I've done my bit. I've passed it on. Now it's up to you to pass it on to uh, somebody else. Obviously, I will continue, inshallah, for as long as... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me istiqamah and gives me tawfiq and gives me the will uh, can, to continue to do so for, for as long as I have life in these bones and life in this flesh. Um, but at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to carry on. So let's uh, tackle uh, some uh, uh, questions here that we have on there whilst we wait for people to make the call on um, 01274. Uh, 214299. Bear in mind that obviously we are already in well into this uh, second interval, so we won't have much time left for uh, the questions. So let me see what we have co got coming in. Um, mm -mm. So, tu -tu -tu. none of the products contain just a Okay, so let's uh, tackle this question here. So the first question that we have, Assalamu alaikum, is it permissible to name a child Aden? Okay, 
Um, so with regards to Aden, um, my esteemed colleague uh, tells me that it means a tall palm tree, if I'm not mistaken. Um, is that, uh, uh, yep, a tall palm tree. Aden means tall palm tree. It is derived from Ain Dal Noon. Uh, root, which is perpetuity, which is used in many... Oh, now he's getting funny with all this uh, uh, perpetuity, whatever that means. Um, okay, there is also a meaning in Gaelic, which is the, uh, and, you know, where the English word comes from. And that means little fire. So, um, you know, not really anything anything in there. So let me respond back to this uh, uh, to this brother. So, wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother. So we have... Uh, uh, two potential meanings. Uh, one is if we take it for the Arabic meaning, uh, which is Ain Dal Anun, uh, which means tall palm tree. And if we take the English meaning, which is based on the Gaelic name of being called little fire. So, uh, you know, there's neither which seems to suggest any anything which is, uh, uh, you know, of a virtue. And I guess little fire is problematic because we try not to associate ourselves with fire. So I would uh, avoid naming a child uh, that name. Uh, next question that we have is, um, let's have a look at this question. Uh, there is a, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi There is a halal certification company by the name of Tahira. The following is on their page. Please note that all our beef and lamb products come from animals which have been slaughtered by hand without stunning. Chicken products, however, use meat coming from birds which first go through a mildly electric electrified bain mari before slaughtering, but with an inspector on hand to show the bird is still alive. Slaughtering happens by machine. What are the respective ulama opinion on buying meat and chicken that have been certified by this company? Uh, wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Rather than answer with regards to this particular company, uh, let me answer this in a general way based on the information that you have provided. The two pieces of information that you have provided there, uh, which is of concern, is that first of all, chickens, uh, that they use meat coming from birds which go through a electric bath. Okay. Now, I have written extensively about uh, electrical stunning. So please find that paper and read that. The second point that you made is that then slaughtering happens by machine. Uh, which is that there's no hand slaughter. So there are two problems there uh, that, are, that, are, that are problematic. One is obviously that it is um, machine slaughter, which is impermissible. And the second issue is of stunning, which my research has led me to show, led me to demonstrate that there is no control. And those of us who've studied a little bit of electricity uh, will know, for example, that when the voltage is kept the same, uh, then we find that due to resistance, the current can change. So if the resistance increases, the current goes down. And if the resistance decreases, then the current goes up. So therefore, if, for instance, you have a relatively thin bird or the connection is uh, very strong, then there's a high current which goes through that bird. And if you have a fairly big bird or that the bird is not shackled very well, then there could be a low current going through there. So some birds may uh, receive a low current, which would mean that it does not stun them, but it, all it does is cause them pain. So, or some chickens, hens, may receive a very high current, which could cause their death. There will only be some chickens that will get the right dose in the middle and not knowing which one is which makes the process much gook. But obviously, if you ended up with the bird that was killed, it would make it impermissible. So speaking about the process rather than necessarily the organization, those are my concerns with that. Uh, next one is, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Is wudu valid with flavored water like Volvic strawberry flavored water? Okay, so let's re respond to that. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, if, obviously, it, there is a slight flavor with little change in color and little change in taste, then it would be permissible to use that. However, if one found that the viscosity, uh, th meaning the thickness of the water changed, or there was distinctly a, s a strong smell, um, and as well as a taste, then, obviously, it should be avoided. 
Uh, next one is Asalaamu Alaikum. The sunrise was at 4.36 a.m. in Bradford. Today I started to pray Fajr at 4.34 a.m. because I woke up late. Is my Fajr namaz valid? So reply to that. Wa Alaikum Asalaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. From the times that you've suggested, it seems that you would have been praying uh, when the sun was rising, uh, assuming I'm making an assumption that this 4.36 is not inclusive of refraction that this 436 is actually the sunrise time if it's inclusive of refraction then that would suggest if somebody has taken into account refraction and as a result added five minutes then the real sunrise uh, would be at 441 and they've deducted rather uh, five minutes to take into consideration refraction so if they have deducted five minutes to take into consideration refraction then obviously the salah will inshallah be valid if however that 40 436 is actually the sunrise time and you started at 434 then there's no doubt that you will be praying at the time of sunrise which is impermissible to do so so you would have to uh, repeat that prayer Assalamu alaikum. Is there anyone here who would be able to help me with translations of Islamic Arabic tests? Generally, I would do the majority translation and then ask for help or confirmation. Okay, so let me respond to that. Uh, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, that question is not necessarily a fiki question, so I'm, I'm surprised admin hasn't picked that up um, because really it should be a fiki question. But uh, on this panel, if there's a request for translations, then I'm sure somebody would make their time to do so, uh, but I think there would be a cost associated with it if they're giving up their time to assist you in your process. So that covers the questions that I received on there. And I think on that point as well is, you know, being taking sort of, you know, uh, ulama's time for granted. You know, ulama are, you know, are normal people, you know. They have families, they have other things that they do. And there's always this expectation that religious people should just give their time freely and, and do whatever we ask them to do because at the end of the day, we're doing work of deen. Yes, for you, work of deen might be a hobby or work of deen might be something you do on an evening or on a weekend. For these scholars, work of deen is what they do all the time. So if they're just giving their time freely all the time, then you know how are they supposed to provide? And then, and then we have an issue when we say, oh, you know, all the Molvis, they're just waiting on chanda to give them chanda. Well, if, you know, if they were paid for their services, then I guess there wouldn't be a problem uh, for in terms of receiving any donations as such. So as a community, we need to look after our ulama. And whenever we have opportunity to uh, pay them for their services, then we should take that opportunity, like what the brother asked there, that I would like them to look at my translations or whatever. So that would be, you know, something that he's giving his time. So, you know, one should be uh, recompensed for that time. Remember, that recompensation does not mean that he's worked for that wage because he's expecting his wage if he's done it with the intention of reward and ajr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at least it gives him that opportunity to be able to uh, look after his family, his kith and kin, and not have to work extra, extra long hours because of the time that he's giving, say, five, seven hours a day, fi sabirillah. And then he's going to have to work another seven hours to make a living. So now he's working 15, 16 hours a day. So he gets very little time to spend with his family and everything else that goes with it. So we need to be a little bit considerate uh, with our scholars and those individuals who are working in these vocations of providing to the community. So that gets us to the end of those questions, alhamdulillah. So we've done pretty well today. I'm quite impressed myself with myself. I might give myself the rest of the day off, uh, which is that uh, we've covered, uh, <laughs> we've, got, <laughs> we've got a couple, we deal, dealt with a couple of questions um, prior to the interval. And uh, alhamdulillah, we've gone through, uh, the, I have two platforms. I've gone through the ladies platform and dealt with a question or two that came from there. And we've dealt with half a dozen questions which come through on the mail platform. So Alhamdulillah, I'm up to date there. I can hopefully pray that those people whose questions and queries I've dealt with, uh, and they are now in a better position to do what pleases Allah, that they make dua uh, for myself and all those who are trying to assist them in uh, getting, getting close to Allah, in order to assist them in bettering themselves uh, to become better people. But if you do have uh, some outstanding questions and answers and you want to keep me here for a little bit longer, then please do call in 01274 214 299. That's Bradford, uh, 01274 214 299. Otherwise, I'm going to scarper and I'm going to find a fire exit. I'm sure there's a fire exit around here somewhere. 
uh, and, uh, and I'll make a disappearance. But just before I uh, venture to make that disappearance, you know, I will give you a minute or so uh, for you to get your phone out and, and make that call. And whilst you're deciding to you know, get your phone out and make that call, you know, we spoke about Qurbani earlier. And I do want to re-emphasize that point. Uh, hopefully you're seeing a, a video of mine and other presenters being uh, aired on uh, Iqra TV about the up and coming Qurbani and how we should be making preparations and how obviously I speak specifically uh, on behalf of Al Khair Foundation on that particular video in, in explaining the services that they provide to the community which you can utilize uh, in order to have your Qurbani uh, co committed and done. Uh, but generally speaking, this is compulsory. I just you know really want to stress that point. It is compulsory for you to do Qurbani, for you to carry out Udhiyya, for you to have an animal slaughtered. It is compulsory. It is a sin, uh, a major sin not to do so, to avoid that. On top of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for every single fiber of, of, of uh, wool or any single strand of hair or any other type of uh, uh, thing on top of the animal, whatever it be, wool, hair, whatever it be, fur, that is on the animal you will get reward for every single one of them. And that is quite a lot of reward that you're going to receive. So not only is something which is compulsory, it is always also something which is highly rewarding. And the fantastic thing about Qurbani is, like the sister mentioned, that if you do it in this country, you eat it yourself. So it's not as though you're losing out, are you? What are you losing out? You know, okay, you might have steak for a few days, but that's not going to hurt because when you ask your butcher to cut it up into uh, what they call is the special cut, I think the f phrase is, in which they cut the, the chops into, so like chops basically, they cut the leg in a nice way and then they do the steak as well. And getting a steak on the grill or, you know, we're getting good weather coming up, alhamdulillah, on a barbecue, mm, second to none, you know, if you know it's a good, a good recipe to put on that meat to put on top of the, uh, the steak, you really enjoy it. So it's not as if Allah SWT is asking you or telling you to give it all away in the path of Allah. You know, you know don't be greedy either. You, you, know, you get a hundred and, I don't know how many, these 140 pound animal or something. I don't know how much they weigh. I think it's about 50 kg or something like that, 40 kg. You know, don't just, you know, what are you gonna do with all that meat, you know? If you've got people in your area which you know are struggling a little bit, maybe share that with them. If you've got family members, brothers, sisters, parents, give some to them. And then you can keep uh, a significant amount. You've got a big chest freezer, put it in the chest freezer, chop it up into little bits, or rather have it put into little bits, label the bag so you've got steak, you've got chops, you've got leg, you've got shoulder, whatever. And then when you need, and you know, when you've got a chest freezer, it'll stay in there for three, four months. Not a problem. So that is, so, you know, you're not even, so you're getting reward and you're eating. You know, it's a win-win situation. I, I cannot understand how people hesitate. You know, I can understand why people hesitate with zakah. I can understand why people hesitate for hajj. But why people hesitate for qurbani is somewhat confusing for me because you get to eat the meat yourself in a way um, and also share with family. You know, it's a good time to get together, you know, uh, assuming when we get to the, the date that, you know, lockdown is, uh, I don't know if we will be out of lockdown, I can't remember the exact date, uh, we're about um, 20 days away. But even that, you know, you can get some households, I can't remember the exact rules at the moment, so don't quote me on it, but you can get some households together in your back garden, get a barbecue going, and then, you know, do shukr to Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, aren't you gracious, aren't you merciful, that first of all, you ask us to do something, we do that thing, you reward us for it, and then you ask us to keep that animal as well. You know, how, how, what a gracious God, what a gra gracious Allah. You know, if you look at some of the other kind of faiths which existed, people would sacrifice, you know, young girls to, to their gods. Uh, people would take food to their gods and leave them there. Allah SWT wants nothing from you. He, wants no, he doesn't want food from you. He doesn't want money from you. When we give zakat, we don't give it to Allah. We give that zakat, they get spent on the poor. Allah SWT wants nothing from you. He just wants to see and judge you based upon your actions and the, the, the rulings He places upon you, the injunctions He places upon you, the, the matters He places upon you, the responsibilities He places upon you. Are you going to do that or are you not going to do that? And that becomes your affirmation and declaration of your faith. Because if you don't do that, then as much as you say, I'm a Muslim and you self-identify as a Muslim and you have a nice Muslim name, if you're not carrying out the basic foundations of the religion, you've really got to ask yourself a tough question that, you know, I've got to shape up. 
Um, because, you know, if I'm not doing zakat, if I'm not doing hajj, if I'm not doing salah, if I'm not doing qurbani, what the, you know, what am I doing? Okay, you know, where am I? Uh, you know, do I need to uh, you know, take, uh, take steps and, and rectify myself? So, you know, this qurbani is an ideal opportunity which is coming up. And I would say, you know, book early, especially if you're going to look at doing some abroad, then get them booked. If you're going to look at doing one here in the UK, then get in touch, ring your local ulama, ask them to signpost you to a good butchers that are reliable, trustworthy, that will do a good job. Because some, you see, uh, like Al Khair Foundation, like some what they will do, for example, is that they will get the meat and slaughter the meat before Eid Salah. So that's not qurbani because they know it's going to get busy. So they just start booking things in. And when they start booking things in, then already that meat has already been slaughtered before. So you've got to make sure that you go to reliable outlets and, and they do the job properly. May Allah accept our qurbani. May Allah accept our salah. May Allah accept our learning. Wa akhru da'wana. And alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.